Okay, good morning and welcome back for the last day. So the idea of this morning talk was to give an introduction to binaural listening and binaural audio um, because we will have a follow-up talk giving more advanced things in binaural, binaural audio or trans-oral audio. So on the very first day, we had this picture here where I was saying, okay, normally I personally like to categorize uh, spatial sound reproduction into panning techniques, like per, which I call the perceptual model, like stereo surround, vector-based amplitude panning, vector-based intensity panning, whatever. You pan around in between two and three speakers. The other family was sound field reproduction, which regroups wave field synthesis, ambisonics, boundary surface modeling, or control, and whatever. Um, so where the aim was to recreate the wave field inside the room. A physical, or we aim at the physically perfect reconstruction of the wave field, but we've learned that with the number of speakers we have, it's nearby impossible or would be, impos uh, would be possible only for a very small spot in the room. And then there is the third group, which is, we call it signal model, but it's also a perceptual model, binaural transoral. And so I group it in a family. Uh, binaural is listening over headphones. Transoral is playing back a binaural signal, so the left and right ear signal, over two speakers or even more speakers. And then you use crosstalk constellation filters. It's like a little bit the shutter glasses, which you use for film, 3D film. So when you have polarized glasses, one picture for the left eye is polarized that way, so it passes through for the left and is blocked in another polarization filter for the right eye and vice versa. A Little bit more difficult in acoustics because we have to, if you play back for the left speaker to the left ear, you have to cancel the sound which comes to the right ear. So there are, in the traditional way of uh, transoral, uh, which was in huge parts developed by Jean-Marc Schott um, in the 90s. You use cross-talk cancellation filters, but many others, so it's not only him. Uh, um, you use cross-talk cancellation filters to, uh, to get rid of the sound, so the cross-talk in between the left and the right ear. This brings also many problems, because you, again, have to sit in the axis in between the speakers. When you turn your head, it's getting complicated. So in recent years of research, you have more and more systems which come, for example, with head tracking, which compensates for dynamic crosstalk filtering, or even using things like wave field synthesis or in more loudspeaker arrays with beam steering, and they steer the beam to your left and right ear. So I would focus the sound on some people in the room. I would target your left and your right ear um, to get the crosstalk cancellation. But as you can imagine, when I get a sound here, I kind of focus the sound only to your ear. So it goes through you, and so the people sitting behind of you uh, will hear the sound as well. Um, to get rid of all this head tracking, uh, to, to get rid of, of the problem of turning the head, because then transoral very quickly falls apart. You can use multiple speakers. So we've been working with the Conservatory of Music in, in, in Paris on a 5.1 system, which on top of the 5.1 you put a transoral system. So when you are sitting in the perfect listening spot of a 5.1, you get some additional content because then it makes up, you get some elevation information. Without, so the stable base is the 5.1 mix, and um, so you can crossfade in between. Okay, so what's binaural audio? Binaural audio is, as the name is saying, listening with your left and your right ear. So we have spatial auditory perception, because we are using two ears. It's even better than that. We are not only using two positions for the ears, because we are permanently moving. We are turning our heads. So actually, we are scanning the sound field in more than one position. And especially, turning your head is something which your brain perfectly understands, because you give the, even it's for you unconscious, but you always measure the rotation of your head. So that's information which is used by your brain to stabilize the sound field. That's why in, in um, then we'll see in, in binaural audio, it's very important to introduce head tracking. A binaural audio without head tracking brings the source way closer to you 
and it's less stable in Rome. If you have head tracking, you have a better localization, so you have many research papers from Whiteman, Kistler in the 80s, Elizabeth Wenzel, and so a lot of Chaza papers just talking about the importance of head tracking in binaural sound reproduction. So in the very early days, so we see 7057 to 1817, like Wells. So they created many funny devices to understand mainly um, how listening um, or binaural listening. So for example, a stethoscope, which is not linked to just one spot, but to two. And then you could spread it away, so it's like a stereo recording. Just put it somewhere, so you have the le uh, le le level difference. It's a long week already. Mm -hmm. You have the level difference and the time difference in between the two sensors. So it haven't been microphones, but spotted. And then you put it in your ear, and then you could sense the world. And it's, it's, uh, I have never tried it, but I would love to, because you, know, you spread it a little bit away. And I think it's fun to listen to. And so little by little, they understood that the primary localization cues. So this is Statophone, and then Thompson with the Pseudophone, and then you had a device with two tuning forks, slightly detuned, um, so that you have a, a kind of stereo phasing effect in between the left and the right ear, which moved the sound source around. Finally, um, the primary cues of localization, as we call them now, or nowadays, was John Strutt, or better known as Lord Rayleigh. So he was the first um, formulating the duplex theory of localization. <coughs> so to understand that we had level difference or the importance of level difference and time difference in between the left and the right ear linked to auditory localization in space. So here you see the <coughs> ITT, so the interaural time difference. So it's clear when the sound source is coming from the right, what's happening with the wave is it first comes to your right ear, then it travels for base frequency to low frequency. Um, there's diffraction around your head, it travels around your head, it comes to the left ear with a time delay. And the time delay is linked to the distance in between your ears. So your ears are more or less 20 centimeters apart from each other. So with 340 meters per second of the traveling sound wave, you end up with about um, zero point, uh, six uh, microseconds, uh, 0 0.6 milliseconds. So that's what you see here. So that's the 600 microseconds. And if you have 600 microseconds, the delay in between the right and the left ear, your brain knows, hey, the sound comes from the right. If it's in the other way, left ear comes first, hey, the sound comes from the left. And something in between. Here, there's no time delay for frontal sound sources um, in between the left and the right ear. This works for low frequencies because the head is not yet an object in the, for the sound wave. So there is no absorption. If you take the size of a head, we say, OK, up to nearby 1 kilohertz, 1.5 kilohertz. It's still ITD, so the level difference, which is uh, taken into account. Above that frequency, you get shading of the head in the sound field. The he head becomes an object, so the sound wave is blocked. So you do not only have a time delay in between, but also a level difference. So the maximum level difference which you can have for higher frequencies is around 20 dBs in between right and left ear. So the same, if the sound comes from here, it's blocked, so it's louder at the right ear than in the left ear. If it comes from the front, same level in both ears. So that's what we call interaural level difference. So here you see there's a very famous and, and beautiful book by Jens Blauert, um, Spatial Hearing. Um, he was a very important German researcher. He gave, actually, there's a whole Troy lecture series, I found, from him. So he was giving a, a lecture series here in Troy. Um, so he spends, besides there have been many others, like Zwicker, Feldkeller, and also in the US, then later on with Whiteman, Kisler, Wenzel, and, you know, type in Chaza binaural hearing. and. You have another year of papers to read. Um, <laughs> so those pictures are taken from, from Blauert's book. What's beautiful here is that you see 1.5 kilohertz. So that's not saying there is no ITD above. So it's more a group delay above 1.5 kilohertz. It's not saying there is no ITD, so no level, uh, time difference. 
but it's less important. So we talk about the primary localization cue. And now we can imagine the problem, what happens when the sound goes up. If the sound source is in front of me and it goes up, nothing changes in terms of time difference and level difference in the ears. So that's what we call spectral cues. So your ear here introduces very many um, reflections. Above 5 kilohertz, they become important because the size of the eardrum is becoming important. So you get little notches in the frequency spectrum. And you've learned to listen or to interpret, your brain interprets the notches as elevation cues. Which brings us to the point of binaural hearing. If I send a left and right ear signal, which was recorded with a dummy head in the room, to the headphones you're wearing, then we face the problem that it was recording whether with your head size, whether with your ear distance, nor with your pinacues. It somehow works because ITD is somehow close. If you have 18 centimeter ear distance or 20, it's the same curve, but a little bit distortion. ILD, okay, the dummy head is nearby your size, getting nearby, okay, but all this little cues which you have for perceiving a sound in elevation or with height are broken. So your brain gets a notch here, which is maybe a notch for you, which says, oh, the source is at 30 degrees. But for my ears, it says, oh, no, it's at minus 15. A little bit extreme, but could happen. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of confusion. Um, but anyway, I'll show you later on it works Anyway, you can learn to listen with somebody else's ears, which is quite nice. Auditory localization is really great. So, so the main things which we want to get rid of in binaural sound reproduction is we want to have a stable localization and we want to get rid of front-back ambiguities. So we call this the cone of confusion. Um, and we want to get a good out-of-the-head localization of the sound source. Okay. So maybe I start with some binaural recordings. So Fletch in 55, they had these funny, funny dreams of um, what we actually have now. Um, it's called cochlear implants for um, hearing impaired people. So that, but this was the first invention more or less of the idea of a dummy head. So you record, you put microphones on, on, on a head, which then gets more abstract with the Schoep's, um spherical microphone, right? Um, where you have two microphones on a sphere, which is a very abstract representation of a head. There has been also the, what's the name? The plate in between the two uh, microphones, the Yeklin, Yeklin plate in between the two microphones. It's just an approximation of level difference and time difference um, of the how to say, um, medium head size of all people. It's very funny, um, I've, I had the, the nice chance to be guest researcher in, in, in the lab with Yuichi Suzuki in, at Toyohoku University in Sendai, which is a, Yuichi Suzuki is a, a researcher who has done a lot of research in, in binaural audio and auditory perception. And when you look at the dummy heads there, it's Asian size heads. So I'm, I'm not racist, don't get me wrong. Um, but it's just funny to see because if you look at the um, German dummy heads, they somehow look like we look like. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's important. It's important because it better matches the heads which may listen to it. But luckily, with head-related transfer functions, we get rid of dumb, dummy head recordings, although they are really great. So here you have the very famous Kemar. Um, so it was um, so the first set or one of the first sets of HDFs which have been available to the public. So when I started working um, around 2000 with, with binaural um, audio technology, so the only set which you can easily access was Kemar and SIPIC. So Kemar uh, was, was the Neumann head here. Oh, with the Kemar head, sorry. Um, um, the funny thing is, as you can see here, you can change the eardrums. So you could make your own eardrums. So here it was clay modeling. Nowadays we use 3D printers, um, it's easier. So you can get a 
uh, 3D scan of your of your eardrum, and then you just put it in there. So there are many research pa papers like which do a subjective evaluation of dummy head recordings, for example. Then um, a very great PhD thesis of um, uh, Veronique Larcher. Um, she was working, uh, she's, I guess, still working with Sennheiser. Um, unfortunately, the, the, her PhD is in French only, but it's a wonderful work about different equalization techniques uh, for binary recordings. So like free field compensation, direct dependent compensation, diffuse field compensation, which we nearby, so which we always use nowadays with, with, uh, with HDF data banks. That's a great, if you speak French or if you have somebody to translate, it's really a nice work to read. And recently, um, especially also with 3D printing, I don't know how much you're into acoustics and, and room acoustics, but when you work in a, in, a, in a big project in room acoustics, we still do scale models. Because we have a lot of simulation techniques in acoustics, but some of the very low frequency effects in a room are very difficult to simulate because you need um, boundary element models, or which you normally do in the time domain. So they're very CPU expensive. And so when you have a huge project, a scale model is not a cost factor. So when you do a small concert hall, or whatever, a scale model might become a cost factor. So that's a little printed dummy head. Um, so in the scale 1 to 20, which you can use with um, a scale model or scale model recording, um, which, is, which is quite nice. And recently, people also try to do little spherical. So if, if you're in puppetry, um, you should work with scale models because it's fun. You do your little tiny uh, microphone arrays. You do your little tiny tummy heads. So that's really beautiful. Uh, excuse me, on the previous yeah. picture, okay. I suppose that the shoulder is also, the also there are studies which show actually you had first only dummy heads, mm -hmm. then you had the head and torso models, mm -hmm. and there are some studies which study the impact of turning the head and the shoulder reflections. Then there is even there's a nice study from Brian Katz back in Country Member, mm -hmm. um, the impact of hair. Um, so you can study everything. The fine thing is, I, I show you then a paper or, or the results of a paper by Hoffman in 98, if I remember it right, who shows that you can learn listening with other people's ears. So on the one hand, it's nice. I have several sets of my personal HDFs. So there is a huge improvement in binaural listening when you use your own HDFs. So you get a bit out of the head localization, blah, blah, blah. We'll see this later on. But I can, since I was studying in 2000 to work with binaural audio when I was still developed at AKG Acoustics. I was working all day with Schema. And I'm very good in listening with Schema because I get used to it. So I know when I, I, I'm really good in localization with Schema, although the Schema head doesn't match my head at all. So that's quite nice in, in audio localization. But you find, as I was saying, you find a lot of Chaza, especially Chaza paper. Um, just type in binaural auditory localization, HDFs, and then you, you get a lot of things. OK, we go on with the little introduction to binaural hearing. So what you do now, you can imagine you, you record a signal with a dummy head, let's say, um, in an anechoic chamber. Or you sit yourself in the anechoic chamber. You put tiny microphones at the entrance of your ear canal, and then you measure several positions, or very many positions, in the space, the transfer function in between the source and your left and your right ear. So that's what we call head-related transfer functions. Or normally we use the impulse response, so it's a head-related impulse response. So you measure for this position here, then you use an anechoic signal, you filter the anechoic signal for the corresponding filter corresponding to the position where you want to position your sound source in space, for the left and the right ear, then you get exactly, or should get exactly the same signal at the entrance of the ear canal than you would have when you sit by yourself in the anechoic chamber, and you localize the sound source from this direction. If you want to move the sound source around, you need filter set for every position. So the panning in between those filters, because if you do simple amplitude panning and you go up in elevation, so what's happening is, 
I was saying you have notches in the spectrum which tells you above five kilohertz when the sound source is going up or down. Panning in between two notches doesn't move the notch. You get two notches with half as steep uh, or half as big as, as they've been in the spectrum before. So the simple panning in between two um, HDF sets doesn't work very properly. So you need more advanced panning like um, decomposition in spherical harmonics or whatever. We're always coming back to spherical harmonics. Okay, so how does it look like? That's just a boundary, a boundary element method simulation. So you have a point source here. That's your head. It's a scan of the head, a high resolution MRT scan of the head. Let's go. So the sound source, uh, the sound wave is propagating in space. You get reflections, absorption, diffraction, and here the sound wave comes later to um, the ear, which is far away from the eardrum. So that's another way to get your HDFs. We'll come to this big later. You get a scan of your head, and then you do a boundary element, element method simulation of your head to compute your head-related transfer function. And quite many research projects recently have shown, so since I think 2010, we can easily do it up to 20 kilohertz, easily. So you can find many research papers which show you um, that it works accurately. So that's how it looks like uh, an HDF set, just in the horizontal plane. So you have here azimuth degree, so the angle in horizontal plane and the frequency up to 16 kilohertz. So for low frequencies, you see not a lot of le level variation, which is normal because your head is not yet an object for the frequency uh, or is not an, an object that is, is absorbing a sound wave with low frequencies. And as we've been saying, around 1 kilohertz, 1.5 kilohertz, you get all these notches. Uh, you get the level difference, sorry, which is linked to the source position. And then here in the higher frequencies, you can see here the little notches which come from the reflections of your eardrum or the pinna. So here you see the variations. That's a graphics taken um, from uh, the PhD of uh, Veronique Larcher. So you see over 70 listeners, quite a lot, a huge variation in between the HDFs, and of course also in between the time difference, uh, for the time difference in between the left and the right ear. It's clear because just look around you, the, our head size is very different. Our eardrums are as unique as our fingerprints, by the way. So there's a huge difference. So that's the whole problem with binaural sound reproduction. It's the use of non-individualized HDFs. So if you use them, you get what we call inside the head localizations. So you do not get the sound source out of the head. Of course, you can use artificial reverberation then. Um, so all the, other uh, all, the, all the other cues which give us distance information. But with a pure HDF, if you do several HDFs um, in different distances, it's very difficult to get the sound source um, out of the head if it's not your HDF. You get a rather poor localization elevation. So the little birds flying on the beach will um, not be very well represented if you do 3D uh, sound recording somewhere. You get an increased front, back, or top, bottom ambiguities. Just imagine the sound source is going 360 degrees around your head, so you will not localize it going around the head. It goes here, normally goes a little bit up in front of you, then it goes back. Some people just only have a panning like in the back, so that's all linked to non-individualized HDFs. If you use your individualized HDFs and you do it properly, then you fool your auditory system because what you represent is exactly localization cues which you would hear for a sound source coming from that direction. Don't get frustrated when you listen to HDFs and the sound source. You convolve the sound source with an HDF uh, for a certain direction, and it doesn't look that far. Uh, doesn't um, seem to be that far away. It has been measured in an anechoic chamber. Sit yourself in an anechoic chamber and listen to a sound source from a certain direction. Close your eyes and estimate the distance in between you and the source. So what you get is a little bit the same. So you get a rather good uh, externalization of the sound source. Um, you get less localization errors, um, but they are still increased 
um, compared to reality. You get a way better front back uh, or less front back confusions than with non-individualized uh, HDFs, but they are still more than in reality. But for truly immersive 3D audio over HD, uh, over uh, headphones, we need individualized, not individual, but maybe individualized HDFs. So we have several ways to get them. We can measure them. So as I was been saying, you sit down in an NNCO chamber, um, you get around 2,000 whatever points measured, um, so source positions measured around your head. Um, the problem is it takes time, it takes an NNCO chamber, so it's not it's nothing you will have for general public that you go into a store and she says, hey, can I get my HDFs measures? Mm -hmm. And you sit down in an anchor chamber and quickly warm it up. Also, we got the time consumption by using, I'll show you this later on, from early systems, which took about one, one and a half hours to measure down to 20 minutes, 15 minutes. But you still need an anchor chamber. Then you have numeric simula simulation, like boundary element models, um, so you solve the diffraction of the acoustic wave at the listener's head and torso. We know that we can do this accurately in terms of computation. It's a relatively high computational load, so there are some nice open source projects. If you have a nice scan of your head, you can compute your HDFs on a 20, I don't know, 20, 20 CPU, 20 core uh, computer with about 256 gigabytes of RAM. You need a lot of RAM that it goes fast. It takes you, I don't know, 12 hours, 14 hours to compute. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that you have to go next door to the supercomputer of RPI to get your HDF. It's a powerful computer which can do the job in, a, in half a day. That's not too bad. But the problem or the limiting problem is you, you need, for boundary element modeling, you need a very accurate scan of your head. It's less important to get the scan of your head here, but the eardrum is really important. And if you do it generally, so ideally, what we want to have is that I take my cell phone, I say, hey, cool, I want to listen to binaural. There's a nice binaural show on the BBC today. So I just scan my head. <laughs> Then I stream it to a server, and two minutes later, I get my HDFs, and I feed it into the system and get my personalized hearing. So that's our little dream. <coughs> Problem is the scanning here. We come back to this later. You can try to model them in other ways. So do you analyze huge HDF databases, and then you reconstruct them from, from basis functions. Another way is that you select them from a huge database. So we give you an audio game. And in the audio game, you have so the typically chicken shooter. And you select your different HDFs. And little by little, you learn from the database which HDF fits best to you. It's even working best when you give some primary parameters, like um, the size of your head, the distance of the ears, and whatever. So since we have now collections, since we, we standardized the AES-60, uh, nine formats or so far, <coughs> and many universities provide huge selections of HDFs. It's nice because you have huge databases which you can work to. And then you train some, I don't know, hidden Markov models or whatever you want to train, and it can, you can get quite a good match. Then when you have found it, you could even take a picture of the ear, and if the database has some morphological data of the ear that has been measured, some labs try to understand what happens if I stretch my ear. And what's the impact on the localization uh, on the on the HDF? Um, I show you this later on. Also, that's how measurements look like. Um, that's the anechoic chamber of Um So you sit on a swivel chair. Um, you have a little. You block the ear canal. You have a nicely positioned small microphone, back electrode microphone, in your ears. You use several speakers, um, and then you move a robotic arm around the head and you sit on the swivel chair and for one and a half hour. It's a very old system, so we used it for the very first time in 2000, I guess. But you sit two hours, no, one and a half hours on the swivel chair and you listen to this beautiful sweep, whoop, whoop, whoop. So you have to bring some effort to get your own ears, but it's not, you know, you get your own HDFs. That's how an exponential sweep signal looks like. We use expo exponential sweeps because with exp exponential sweeps, it's 
quite nicely shown in, in, in some papers by Angelo Farina. You get rid of the nonlinear distortions in your system, like uh, speaker distortions, microphone distortions, whatever, because they're temporally folded before the main sweep. So you can window them out in the response. <coughs> it's nice. Um, so you see it here. This would be the impulse response, the HADF. And those would be little nonlinear distortions. And since we use exponential sweeps, you can show that they temporally, in, they come before the main sweep, and then you take a time window and you just cut the rest off, and you get a rid of all the distortions in your system. So normally we measure in between 1,600 up to 2,800 points around the head. So you get a very fine, dense grid um, of HDFs. So that's another measurement system. Um, um, it's research that has been done at the Academy of Sciences in Vienna by Piotr Majdak. So you use many speakers, and then you do not play one sweep after another. You play them simultaneously, nearby simultaneously. So what's happening is here, I start this sweep here, so it's a whoop. And when I'm here, I say, OK, I have enough distance in frequency, so time is linked to frequency. So I'm here at 10 kilohertz, and I say, oh, at 10 kilohertz, I can already start playing another one at 50 hertz. And then when that one is here, I play another one. So instead of listening to one sweep after another, you play them with a small time delay simultaneously. So you define a ring of loudspeakers, <coughs> which gives you your elevation, um, and then you play them nearby simultaneously. So this, even it, all, the signal is more comfortable, actually. It's uh, quite noisy, but it's nicer to listen 15 minutes to <laughs> then uh, one and a half hour, week, 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 week. That's really annoying. Um, so they use, that's why it's called multiple exponential sweep signs. Um, so you play them simultaneously um, to bring the, the measurement time down from one and a half hours to, to, to 20 minutes around. So we, ha we have our new measurement system, which is not at Aircom, um, because we do not have an anechoic chamber which is big enough. Uh, it's with our partner Orange in Lannion. And they're a uh, research center. So what we just changed, we have a very high uh, density grade of loudspeakers. But we do not put them like here, because this speaker will play and introduce a reflection here. We put them in 90 degrees so that we get rid of the reflections when you play this speaker to this here. And it's an anechoic chamber with a grid floor, so we can have a full circle of speakers, which is quite nice. So when you, I show you then how you can access the data when you go to this uh, BILI data, uh, database. So BILI stands for binaural listening. It was a national funded research project with many partners, including Orange, uh, French uh, Telecom, um, you can access all this data. Okay, uh, the numerical simulation, you have many different kinds of, of numeric simulations. So you take the morphology off your head, you scan it, you model it, whatever you want to do is the, the easiest or simplest model is the so-called snowball model. So everything is a spherish uh, representation of your body. And then the only important part is that you fit in the ear. So in uh, numerical acoustics, we have many different possibilities to solve this, like boundary element models, finite element models, or fast multipole models. If you're not in numerical acoustics, you don't care. You just search as um, a project which, which works. You need, for boundary element, at least five nodes per wavelength. Um, so that's a huge limitation when you want to simulate up to 16 kilohertz. Um, so you need a very, very high accuracy of your mesh grid. Um, the more points you have to simulate, the long it takes. So what you normally do is you remesh. So you take a high resolution scan of your head and your ears, and then you keep the high resolution for the ears, and then you remesh for the head because it's less important. So you get rid of many points that it becomes faster. Many attempts have been done to, to get a good grid or mesh grid of your head, um, from laser scanner to magnet resonance. Um, 
and recently with 3D video cameras um, and, and other scanning devices. So far we didn't succeed to have a good scan in once, so what we normally do is uh, we scan the head and the torso and then we get a print of your eardrum, so a mold, and then we get, we model it and then we scan it with a laser scanner. And then we put it back in the numerical simulation. So that's way easier um, to get a very high resolution scan of the ear. Those silicon headphones that uh, you can buy now, you can model of your ear, I guess it has to do with this as well. There's the silicon headphones? Yeah, there's some sort of silicon headphones that you can uh, send a model of your ear as well and they will print it for you. Yeah, but the problem is always the model of your eardrum. Um, so you need a silicon print. So normally, what you do, you, you take silicon, so you block yeah. the ear canal, you take silicon, you get a print of your of the ear, then you get from the negative to the positive, and then you get a nice positive, and you take time to scan it with a laser scanner, because the problem is the, 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 all the shadowing you have here. So to get a high resolution scan of your eardrum is, you need the whole ear. Because what's happening is when the sound wave is coming from here, I get the little reflections here, and those little reflections define the notches for each position of the sound source. And if the notch is in a different position because I didn't scan it properly, then my brain gets confused because it should be here. So, the, so it's the cue for a source here, um, but the source is actually there because the notch is, is not right in the spectrum. So yes, you're please. Right to the eardrum. Yes. So um, there's another thing with headphones then. There are many attempts to say, okay, but inside the headphone you have also reflections. Um, so what you reproduce actually is not really what you're sending. So the, the idea of binaural is that in the HDF there's your, um, there's your pinna included. So we measure here at the entrance of the ear canal because that's where we reproduce the sound including your pinna cues. But with headphones you have some reflections. So that's, that's a whole equalization, headphones for perfect binaural reproduction, that's another half a year read of Chaser papers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. know, um, so there's all this research in visual neuroplasticity where you'll do like a mirrored glasses and if you, for two weeks, wear the mirrored glasses that show you that the world is upside down, your brain will correct and it'll show you that the world is right side up. So, and I know that there's a little bit of hearing aid research in, in auditory neuroplasticity. Is there, is anyone looking into binaural HRTF with neuroplasticity? Yes, so there's that, this like, beautiful you paper. A headphone with neuroplasticity, or with a, with a uh, if you wore a headphone with someone else's HRTF for long enough, would you just... You just want me to stop talking and get over all these things I'm doing. And no, that's <laughs> a, <laughs> it's a wonderful paper by Hoffman in 98. Oh, super. So it's exactly what you've been explaining. You, so it's inspired by this perceptual test where you wear glasses and they flip the bird upside down and then you wear them and your brain starts bringing the world in the right order yeah. because your brain tries to stabilize the world that you can survive. So the idea here is you had, um, you block the ear canal and you can um, do some, so you can define the frequency, frequencies which go, uh, which will be blocked or go through. So you, def you destroy actually, but you know how to destroy them, above five kilohertz, um, so the elevation cues. So what you see here is for four different subjects. That's a localization grid they have in normal hearing. So you present them with sound coming from certain positions. I can't remember, it's a long time ago that they read the paper, which pointing method they've been using. But anyway, they point somehow like I hear a sound from here, I point, you measure where the point is, and then you get the actual localization of a point. And you see, we do more or less good. So for points, excitation signals from here, the mean we get quite a good localization, more or less good over the people, but we are not so bad in localization. And then you get the earplugs. What's happening is you do not have elevation cues anymore, so your world crashes down to the horizontal plane or for at least one person, <laughs> for whatever reason, to um, an elevated cue. Must be strange when all your world, uh, auditory world is happening here, but anyway. Um, you know, perception is perception. And then the subject's been, been wearing the, the earplugs in daily life. And what's happening is auditomotory feedback. Your brain knows where your hand is. You can grab objects without watching. 
So your muscles are controlled and you always know where your hand is. I come home from work, I close the door, put my keys here, it makes noise. My brain knows the, where the noise comes from because that's my source and it learns how to listen and it re-adapts. Um, it's clear in terms of evolution, um, auditory perception is really important because the field of sight is, is very limited and when the tiger wants to eat you and catch you and it comes from the back, you should better hear it. And if the tiger got you once but didn't kill you but half of your ear is bitten off, um, you have to relearn to localize good because the next time he'll get you. Um, <laughs> so that's what's happening. So over, I can't remember how many days, so you have here nearby one month, but uh, so after one month or, or later, you see how your brain adapts to the new localization cues and it relearns how to listen, which means auditory perception is going on every day. And if, the nice thing is, um, I read the paper about flipping the world upside down. It produces horrible headache, which is nice because when you get it right, you know I have another two weeks of horrible headaches yeah. because you want to get <laughs> not too nice. So I didn't read anything that people had headache from readapting localization, auditory localization. And it's also written in the paper of Hoffman. What's really beautiful is that at least for two patterns, people could nearby have the same localization with and without the earplugs. Mm. So at least you have two memories. Uh, maybe there are some follow-up studios which say you have six, seven memories. I didn't follow up, but at least you have two memories, which is quite impressive. So they could afterwards say, hey, I take my earplugs in or I take my earplugs out. I didn't find this paper uh, back in 2000 when I started to work with Kemer, but um, I found it way some years later. Um, but what's beautiful for me to explain why it works that I can listen with Kima quite well because I've been developing binaural systems on Kima. And it's an active task. So I've been moving sound sources around with this very first magnetic trackers, uh, electromagnetic trackers. So you take a tennis ball, you take it in there and you move the sound source. And what I did, I trained my auditory perception because I attached sound in the virtual image to my hand. I know where my hand is. And actually that's a listening experiment we did years later to learn auditory perception or HADFs by moving objects around in space. So that answers your yeah. questions, I think. <laughs> so that's boundary element models or fast multiple models. There's the, the, this very, very beautiful book. When you want to get into this theory of fast multiples of Kumarov and Duraswamy, it's about 400 pages, pure mathematics on fast multiple metal models, um, but it's really beautiful. So we see here in, in 2001 uh, with the PhD of Brian Katz, who is research at Sorbonne University. Um, BEM's been okay up to six kilohertz. Uh, Kahan and Nelson, so Phil Nelson is from Southampton University in the UK. 2006, we could do it quite accurately up to 10 kilohertz. And then with Kreutzer um, and his colleagues of the Academy of Sciences, uh, in Vienna uh, in around 2010, at the same time also Gumarov and Duraiswami. We could do it on standard computing devices up to 20 kilohertz, because what's counting here is numerical accuracy in the representation of your uh, simulations. So all the problems we had here was really the resolution which you need for running your calculations and computations. And the nice thing is this model here, the software is called mesh to hdf and what's here, it's freely available on SourceForge. So they publish this as open source. The nice thing about this mesh to HDF project is they scanned many hats, they measured the HDFs, they did boundary element simulations, and then they compared the boundary element simulations with the measured data, and they have quite a good and decent match. So it's, a, it's valid. So they did it with many people and dummy heads. So that's an HDF, uh, so a boundary element modeling simulation, which was be, uh, has been verified for HDF data. So it's quite nice. It's easy to use. Um, so you just need an SDL off your head scan. However, you it's up to you to get your your scan well done. They don't care. So you put it into Blender, which is also open source. 
In Blender, you just have to trick a little bit with the vertices to make sure that they all point into one direction. So for those of you who are in computer graphics, it's easy to use. Select all points and run the algorithm. You can use also another um, open source program, which is published by the University of Aachen in Germany. So the RWTH, uh, which help you to remesh your HDF scan to bring the computational load a little bit down. And then you start a little Python script. Um, it runs on Linux. So um, you start a little Python script in Blender, which starts the rendering. And depending on how much CPU power you have, so our server, which is running the computation, is a 20 core. Yeah, 20, has 20 cores, I guess. Yeah, 20 or 24, and 256 gigabytes of RAM. That's important. 128 is OK. 256 is better, but it's a machine, you know, you get it for, it's nothing you have to buy for hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's something you get for $4,000. Um, so that's nothing. And then what, you, what drops out at the very end is a sofa file with your HDFs. So that's pretty nice because sofa is now a well-established, so it's AES69 sofa. It's a well-established format and even MPEG-H except so far as an input format for HDFs now. Um, so we could partner with MPEG-H, which is quite nice. And it's an open standard, so, and you have many tools. I'll show you then how you can access the tools to deal with HDFs like this. Okay, so if you want to model your head, just get a good head scan and then just try to set up such an environment and you can start working on HDF simulations. So that's just um, the grid accuracy you need. So this is the highest grid with one. So that's one millimeter here, a grid. And so you can, for different frequencies, also subdivide, because for lower frequencies, you don't need the high resolution grid. Um, but that's getting a little bit more tricky and more advanced. So if you model one HDF for your one scan you have, you shouldn't waste 50 hours on remeshing your heads to get your calculation from 20 hours down to 12, because you already wasted 50 hours. Um, but of course, it's important because the aim of this, this project was called Locophoto, was that you just send a scan of your hand to, a head to a server, and then you get the data back. The problem with this is, um, if this gets established, NSA will have fun because instead of getting all your fingerprints, they get all your ear prints. Um, so it's, very, it's unique, your ear prints. So currently we, we, have, we have many databases which contain morphological data, um, but it's tricky to use them or to provide them to public because it's private data. Then what you can do is um, you can deconstruct your HDFs into so-called basis functions. So we've learned about basis functions when we've been talking about ambisonics. So ambisonics, you can imagine, is nothing else. When you measure all your HDFs around the heads, it's a representation of the sound pressure on the sphere. Hey, we have a sphere. If you do the Fourier transform of the spherical surface, that's the decomposition of the spherical harmonics. Another method, which was shown by, by Weibmann Kistler and uh, also Veronique Larcher, is to use principal component analysis and independent component analysis. Um, so they can show that you need less than 10 principal components, so basis vectors, um, to represent your HDFs. And then it's getting easier to find matching data in huge databases. Because instead of having to compare with 2,000 HDFs um, you just compare with 10 principal components. Then a recent PhD, which was done by Pierre Guillon in, at uh, Orange Labs in, in Lannion. And that's clustering of HDFs. So you, get H you regroup them in the huge databases that you can get faster access and you can find them. And then you could also do group them by spectral features generated from listening tests, actually. The aim is that you get a better search to find the best match to your HDFs. That's what we want to achieve. Knowing that so far it's difficult that you get your own HDF measured, but then it would be nice if you just take a huge database and through a little audio game or whatever, um, you very quickly can access the best match or find the best match in the data. This could be also a virtual walkthrough or whatever. Um, 
So this goes into big data analysis, deep learning. So it's nice because it brings us to all the keywords uh, which you need nowadays to get national research grants. Disruption. Um, disruption, it's another one. But you know, you have, we try to adapt our research projects to keywords which bring us as money. Another thing is, um, you can separate the HDFs into the spectral cues and, and the, the uh, excitation phase, which is the ITD more or less. So the aim is to control them independently, that you say you have the spectral cues represented by the HDF, and then the time delay would just be a delay into your reproduction. And uh, with this, you can then adapt to the, uh, the ITD cues, so the time difference cues in between the two ears, uh, very nicely to the size of your head. Yes? Is the, on the previous slide, is the uh, EO in 2009 a thesis or a paper? I can't even it, find the paper. It's a thesis, and I can't remember. I think it's written in French. Yeah, it is. I once, found French once again, yeah. It's a beautiful wor uh, work, um, so it's quite a lot of pages to read. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if he has published it yet. He should have. There is this French server which regroups all the research papers, which is called HAL, so HAL, um, and maybe search there. Um, because we are, we are forced actually to publish all the uh, so preprints in, in open content, um, which is nice. I think it's beautiful to do it that way. So as I was saying, we want to to get in the, uh, an individual selection of non-individual HDFs from a database, which would be the best match. And the problem is to find an efficient search method. So um, Bernhard Seber, who is in Munich, or Yuki Weyer, uh, who is in Sendai, have been working on this problem. Uh, which parameters should we consider? Um, what's to measure the quality of externalization? Um, so you can find a lot of, of, of papers there. Or, you do morphological comparisons with the problem that we are not allowed to do it um, so far. So to match the morphological parameters. So that's the open question. Can, when we have a sufficiently enough uh, HDFs uh, database, which is big enough, can we find HDFs um, that sweet um, all the listeners? Some studies show it could be possible, but so far we don't have any research paper giving a proof showing that it's work, so it's ongoing work. Then there we have the HDF tuning. Uh, so the HDF tuning is trying to um, understand when I scale my pinna, what's happening to the HDF. So um, the frequency scaling, you can already find, find, find back to papers of Middlebrooks in 1990 and 2000. Um, then the spatial rotation the papers by, so that's also in a, a paper, not a PhD, by Pierre Guillon um, and by Marquis in 2005. Um, so we try to understand what's happening is, so just imagine you take a picture of your pinna, you send it to a server, the server finds already a good match to the pinna, but it's not really looking like your pinna. You try to match it as good as possible and you, by scaling. And when you understand what happens, the influence of the scale parameter to your notches in your uh, frequency spectrum of the H or in your HDF, in the notches in the HDF, you can then adapt it. So you first search the best match um, to your pinner, which is quite easy picture search. You know, Google can do this. So we have efficient algorithms. And then, although it's not perfect, so here, then you scale it to match the one you found, and then as we understand the scaling, or we try to understand the scaling at least, you can modify your, the HDF taken from the, from the database, that it's even a better match to what you want to hear. And so we've already talking about this paper. So that's another thing you can do, especially in VR, um, in interactive VR. Just try to find the best match however you do it. And then let them play around 10 minutes of adaptation. So there are some project by Brian Katz currently looking at how long it takes you to improve your localization with non-individualized HDFs by using interactivity. So that's a very old study here, back from 2006 or 5. Um, so you take an object, you move the object around. So this 
we didn't have all the remotes that time. Um, so now it's rather easy. You set up a VR environment and then just move around. And then you can link it even not only to audio motory feedback, but also to vision. Uh, with VR, which is even better because we have a multimodal perception. So you find another hundred papers to read on what happened if sound is not aligned to picture and picture not aligned to sound and in time and in space and in whatever. A lot of work by Isabel Vio del Mont. Yes, please. Um, so um, was it determined how long it takes in VR? Not yet. That's currently, um, so there are studies, there are some guesses. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of science, I could not yet say um, how long it is. I would have to ask Brian. He was recently uh, running a lot of listening experiments, mm -hmm. setting up a VR system at, at, at the Sorbonne University. Um, but it's not that long. So we talk about 15, 20 minutes to improve. Yeah. And then it's the question, what means improve? So you, 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 you get better. But it's not yet a perfect match. And there is some kind of saturation. I'm sure you will never reach the goal. But at least you can improve. You can improve by doing something interactive. And you, it doesn't have to be a training period. So we had a very nice experiment, which I don't know yet the results, in a VR environment. So a head-mounted display, binary reproduction. And the only thing you have to do is there are little robots which are coming to you, and you have to shoot them. And they coming from here and here and here and everywhere. You're free to move. And when you, it was very funny to see the people who deal a lot with spinal audio. You know, it's a little cowboy game there. Um, so you stand there, and then you don't even see the robot, but you shoot, <laughs> um, which is a lot of fun. So, but you learn. It's it's very funny because then they give you not your HDF set. So we have a huge panel of listeners where we have the proper HDFs. And then they put distortion, so for example, another ITD in your HDF sets. So your um, elevation cues are still OK, but the cues here. And so now currently, they do a lot of correlation analysis to see what impact has what modification in, in, in the game. So, But it's, it's quite fun when you do such things. Brian, what was the last one? Cuts. Uh, K-A-T-C, yeah. So he's at Sorbonne University at the Laboratory of Acoustics and Mechanics or Music. Um, but you, you, you find him. He's just put in chas and cuts, then you find a lot of papers. But anyway, it's, it's, it's very interesting with all this interactivity we can easily provide, because so many people now start having head-mounted displays and the little remotes or however you call the devices. Um, which are really accurate and, and easy to set up, uh, which brings us closer to provide people with training methods. Another problem we have in binaural is there's this beautiful paper by Brungart in 1998 um, who shows how HDFs change with distance. So normally we measure them in, in about two meter distance from the ear, so we're in the far field of the head. And from acoustics we know the closer the source gets, you get a lot of near field effects. It's tricky to measure because you cannot use a speaker and move it closer because then you have the reflections of the speaker in your measurement. So Brungard was measuring this with a tube, so which gives you a, a small point source, but equalizing the tube is really tricky. So that's the tube which you can see here. So that's really tricky to measure with a tube because you have equalized the resonances of the tube. It's, it's a real pain because it introduces a lot of distortions. Um, so we've done it the other way around. We put little speakers in the ear, but only for dummy heads. Since we cannot control the sound pressure which goes into the ear canal, it would be a little bit dangerous um, with dummy head. And in acoustics, you can inverse sender and receiver. And so simultaneously, you can measure many, many distances uh, in the head. And there have been many models, which um, so the one is if you have an HDF here in the source and you move it closer, I like students doing beautiful animations. <laughs> um, you get the distance attenuations, um, so you change the direct to reverb ratio, but you also change the HDFs because it's not the same HDF anymore, because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's perspective which is changing. So there is this nice paper by Brombo Cook, um, which they call it cross ear selection, because the right ear actually doesn't get the HDF which was before here; it gets an HDF which moves the closer you get.
So that's the crosshair selection. Um, so you compensate for delay and gains. Um, so that's the near-fit compensation, which was proposed by Dudar and Martins in 1998. And if you impl implement this, you get a, already a very stable and nice near-field effect. So you can have somebody whispering in your ear, and it sounds really great. So there was a paper by Doris Wami um, on when you do a spherical harmonics decomposition of the sound field. We've learned already that you can use these Bessel functions or Hunkel functions, depending on your boundary conditions, to compute when you know the wave field at a certain distance and there is no source in between um, the distance where I want to compute this wave field and um, the sphere where you know the wave field, you can compute it by using the Bessel or Hunkel functions or whatever um, your boundary conditions are. So we can use, if you have a high density grid, which we normally have with HDFs because we measure up to 3,000 points. Why do we measure up to 3,000 points? As we've already learned when talking about holophony and ambisonics, that all the sound field reproduction sweet spotish thing is so limited that we do better panning with ambisonics and not the sound field reproduction, because for a little bubble inside the room around your head, we would need 900 speakers. Here, for the measurement, we sit in a defined position. So you normally take three laser pointers or head tracking, and if the person which is measured moves the head out of this little center, you stop the measurement, and because we are not allowed to fix the head. That's classified as torture. Mm -hmm. um, one and a half hours, weep, weep, and your head is fixed. In the, no, that's torture. Um, <laughs> so but what's happening is you can use, or you can show that you can use far field HDFs because we have a high resolution, high enough, so up to order 30 of the spherical harmonics decomposition, which is good enough for representing a sound field in about 20 centimeter sphere up to 16 kilohertz around the head. So we know that, physically speaking, we do it in a correct way. And if we have a, the problem is already sampling. So if we would have critical sampling on the sphere, it would only be 900 plus whatever points. Since we do not critically sampling because we sit on a swivel chair, um, it's a Gaussian grid, and a Gaussian grid needs twice as many sampling points um, as a critical sampling grid would need. So we have about 1,800. 1, so we, when you do a little bit your condition numbers and whatever, you end up with having about 2,000 sampling points around the head. So this was just for a study, a little loudspeaker in the ears. You measure simultaneously the different distances. I think we did 10 distances. And then what we did, we take the far field HDFs or the near field HDFs, and then we do range extrapolation and we extrapolate to the different distances and we look at the results. So what do you see here? It's a measurement at 30 centimeters. Then you do a spherical harmonics decomposition. So you see already, you reprocheck and see if your decomposition is done well, because when you start introducing errors here, there's no way that um, it should work in the far field. Then you do a range extrapolation here to a distance of 136 centimeters far from the head, and then you compare it to the measurement. And you get quite a good match. It's not perfect, but it's, um, since it's based on measured data, you have noise in there and blah, 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 blah. But you get a quite decent match. You can do it the other way around. You take a measurement at 1 meter 50 distance wherever it was measured, and then you compute the near field HDFs out of the measurement. So you take the entire database and you do your scaling with all the data. So you take all the information to do the scaling. Um, it works quite well and also perceptually speaking, it's really impressive um, when you get a source moving very close to your ear. Okay, that's just the error prediction, which is clear in the very high frequencies, you get an increased error um, in the reproduction. <coughs> That's a study back from 2009 or 10. Uh, we can be perform way better by applying regularizations. That's mathematical things you can apply to make this inverse problem more stable numerically. Okay, just a few words before I stop here. Um, there are two very nice projects um, because we've been thinking about setting up a sound server here, and you come all with your headphones and. Um, then we thought it's too complicated. And so it's binaural, so you can listen at home. Um, there are 
as I've been saying when introducing binaural, that broadcast gets very interested in binaural. And so we had two huge projects with broadcast. The one was the Billy project with French radio, French te television, so a national research project. And there's this beautiful uh, website, which is called hyperradio.radiofrance.fr. And you have very many productions uh, which have been done, recordings in 3D, uh, productions, the radio play in, in audio. So it's a, it's a huge collection of beautiful things. The radio plays are mostly often in French, but you, you have, um, for example, here, this is, yeah, here. There's this beautiful John Soren organ concert in, recorded and, and then produced in binaural. Um, so it's beautiful to listen to these things. It's not yet, so the player will be improved. There is a prototype of the player where you can access information of the database we've been measuring to get a better match of your HADFs, but that's work in progress by our partner Orange. So it's a nice thing if you get interested in binaural, uh, it's really you find a lot of, of things. Then we've been the last three years working in a huge project which was called Orpheus, which you can see here, which was an object-based audio, um, together with German broadcast, Swedish broadcast, BBC, um, BBC Research. And on the BBC Research page, you can find also a lot of beautiful radio plays and explaining binaural. So they've, they've been doing a lot of production recently while making their studio. Rama already showed you yesterday how you can use um, SPAT for binaural production. Um, so that's just the Orpheus Studio. And we don't have yet a website for it, I'm sorry. So there will be a, a website which is called hdf.ircam.fr, but so far it's called opendup.ircam.fr uh, because it's a question of time to set all the things up. So um, the SOFA format, I didn't talk a lot about SOFA. Uh, what's nice in SOFA is it's a standardized self-contained format. You don't need any other information than the file itself. So it's self-descriptive. Um, you get all the positions of the data. You have conventions like free field HDFs. So get free field HDFs or uh, head-related impulse response data. Like here you see the convention simple free field HRIR, which are head-related transfer functions in free field. Um, because there are other conventions which uh, have room-related, head-related transfer functions and whatever. Um, so currently you, you can browse it by using the little HDF object in, in SPAT, which directly connects to the server, which gives you a graphical surface, but it's very easy to, to write this, a small parser in, 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 a, in a uh, web language like Python or whatever. And here you have the three projects. The one was Listen back in 2000 whatever, Cross mode was around 2006, and Billy was the huge um, project we've been, we've been working in. And here you find a lot of data and different sampling frequencies. So here, 56 subjects, for example, and they've been measured in a very high resolution grid. And this database is open access, um, so you can use the data. And um, we constantly put other data in there. So it's quite nice. And if you want to learn more about the SOFA format, there is the SOFA conventions. OK. So this website explains the SOFA format. You get all the information. For those of you who are developers, you get APIs. So you get a nice API in MATLAB um, and Octave. Then we have an API in C++. Then we have a new API in C++, which is a lightweight API done by different people, and then you have WebRTC APIs and whatever. So it's rather easy to use, um, also for you as a developer. And um, here is a collection of, we didn't regroup them yet in the database, um, because we have not yet all contract signs, but you have a database of the um, Acoustic Research Institute of the Academy in, in Vienna with 120 subjects. Um, you have um, the old ones like SIPIC in there. Um, that's um, the University of Sendai, which provide another 100. So you have hundreds of HDFs, and it's very nice when you work with students, um, especially on learning, on finding the best match of HDFs. Because before 
you had to search the HDF, to download the HDF, to read the paper, to see how they've been measured, which measurements points have been. You had to convert the CPIC format to a format which is usable. Um, so that's very nice. It's done because you just download the file and you interpret, interpret the file and it's uh, done. The only thing you now have to um, find another content for undergraduate students other than converting and finding HDF databases, um, which is also nice. So it's constantly upgraded and you'll find a lot of data. And I think a very nice topic is um, when you go now into deep learning or big data, so you know, hundreds of, of HDF data, saying it's big data is maybe a little bit. <clears throat> but let's call it big data. Um, it's, it's, it's really beautiful. So yeah, when you, when you want to work with binaural, um, SPAT provides, as I was saying before, um, renderer for point sources moving around. You can also decode ambisonics very easily in a, using a virtual or whatever setup, using virtual speaker setup as we've been showing yesterday. Or you can directly go, I don't know if, yet, if it's yet in the release, from ambisonics domain to HDFs, knowing that you would need order 30 of HDFs. Uh, uh, so we have order 30 of HDFs. You would need an order 30 recording if you want to have full profit of the entire frequency range in binaural. But anyway, um, it's a little bit like with all the speaker systems. They look good in paper. They look bad in practice. And however they work, because we can do nice music uh, with surrounding speaker arrays or wave feed synthesis or whatever. OK, so thank you very much. I think the time is over. And I think the, the next speaker would like to set up. Um, are there any questions? Or we can then talk when there is a coffee. Just one quick one. Sure. So I looked through this before, and there's a bunch of databases with anthropometric uh, uh, measurements and 3D models. But I've not found a corpus of HRTS matched with photographs. Do you know of a? Um, no, because we are not allowed to publish them. Oh. You have to sign an NDA um, and to get the data with the morphological data. Ah, you have an ERCAM? Um, we have one at ERCAM, uh -huh. and um, the big database is with Orange okay, sure. um, in Lannion because it's, we cannot give it away uh, for general public. Yeah. Uh, about the 3D headphones, I understand that uh, there's a for sale already for $30 or $40 a little tracker that you can just put hmm? on your head and tracks the HRTX convolution hmm? graph. But there's these new headphones, the OZIX, which mm -hmm. was kind of a flop, um, that they say they are 3D headphones. Do they mean they have the trackers built in on the headphones? I don't know. I didn't look at them, so I can just say something wrong because I don't know the product. But 3D headphones is just, yeah, it's, it's HDFs. Actually, you know, you can call them in very many different ways. Um, normally, it's all the same. So if you want to virtualize a sound source, you need HDFs. However you put them together. Um, there is some very funny and rather radical um, HD, uh, papers on binaural listening, especially on Japanese labs from NHK and, and whatever. They say you need just a few notches, and they do completely synthetic HDFs. And they say, your imagination or your brain in the interpretation with the brain, your auditory system is good enough to interpret it in a way that it, it works. So I haven't heard any results, but they, it's really funny because they, they match the ITD, they match the ILD, so get a very rough scan of your head. And then they introduce notches, um, which they control, and you adapt them a little bit. And I haven't heard it yet, but I, I like the approach. Um, but all this, you know, you have now the startup companies everywhere. I'm just wondering if I saw what you did. There's several. We can talk It only can be something which is linked somehow to HDFs um, or. Or have a real tracker that tracks your movements. Also, tracking your movements, you need HDFs to virtualize your sound source. Sure. Because otherwise, you. Otherwise, yes.